Well, thank you, Ron, so much. Um, I think the last session is a perfect um, place to move forward to this. So um, both will touch on kind of scaling the security team. Um, how Nick spoke about some like the team's capacity oftentimes is wasted on responding to alerts versus doing really um, addressing critical risks in the environment. So we'll talk about how um, we can help them really scale security teams with a new operating model. So for this session, um, we'll talk about future proving cloud security with CNAP. So again, cloud native application protect protection platform. Um, and we'll discuss what that means in a few slides for now. But my name is Shaked and I'm from the product marketing team here at Wiz. So um, I'll do a quick overview for those who are not familiar with Wiz, but again, we're CNAP platform, so essentially a cloud security solution. And we help customers build and secure, um, secure everything they build and run in the cloud. So um, that's across, um, so CNAP consolidates a lot of different silo tools. Um, so for example, um, traditional CSPM tools, vulnerability management tool, Keem solutions. Um, and we'll see what are, are all the components of the CNAP in a few slides. Um, but we bring all of it together to help customers really effectively, proactively remove risks in the cloud. So like Ron mentioned, we want to detect those risks early on and proactively remove them. Um, so uh, Wiz is trusted by more than 40% uh, of the Fortune 100 um, organizations, and that's across different industries, um, from large tech companies like Snowflake and Salesforce to financial services like Morgan Stanley and other companies across the board. And we're very proud to be chosen as the leader in cloud security based on our customers' reviews on G2. Um, so with that, why is it that Wiz is trusted by so many customers? Um, so obviously, um, most customers, most organizations as of now are using the cloud and the cloud and have adopted the cloud. But the cloud really changed a lot for security organizations. And what are some of those changes that security organizations are facing? So most of you are probably familiar with it, but obviously in the cloud, we now have a new type of environment that can be a multi-cloud environment, whether you're running in AWS, Azure, GCP, um, each has their own unique services, um, as well as you might have different types of architectures like containers and serverless functions. Um, and the cloud makes it really easy for anyone in your organization to go in and launch new resources at the click of a button, right? So. Um, with this dynamic, changing, and multi-cloud environment, um, it gets challenging for security organizations to ensure they have visibility into everything that's running in the environment. So that's um, change number one is, how do I get visibility into my environment and make sure I don't have any blind spots? The next type of change that it brought is that um, risks in the cloud are more complex now. So um, when we look at removing critical risks, we don't just look at vulnerabilities, right? Um, so as we mentioned, we can have many, many alerts for vulnerabilities in the environment. But in the cloud, we really want to take into account other types of risks. Um, they're unique to the cloud. So for example, cloud resources, misconfigurations, identities, lateral movement. So an attack path in the cloud is a combination of all of those. And we really want to understand how can an attacker, for example, um, exploit a vulnerability and move laterally in my, in my environment and reach my sensitive data, for example. So um, it becomes challenging for organizations to prioritize the real risks in the cloud and eliminate the noise because they need to have all that context in order to effectively, proactively remove those risks. And the third change here is that um, with the cloud, there's obviously a new ownership model now where the developers are experimenting with new services in the cloud, launching new um, servers and so on. And security teams really want to make sure that security is ingrained into whatever the developers are doing, right? So how do I ingrain security into our teams across all teams in the organization? Um, and here we can look at it also from this angle. So this graph shows the API account um, that AWS has introduced. So this is constantly growing as AWS and other clouds are introducing more and more services, more and more features. So um, with this growth, it really is challenging for security teams to keep up with all the new types of services, new types of architectures, um, and having this as well as across clouds. So with this new agility that the cloud in introduces, it also introduces an increased attack surface. Um, so with that, we know that exposure still remains a key risk in the cloud, um, as it can be fairly easy for someone to accidentally expose a resource um, 
to the internet. So whether it's um, publicly exposed buckets, exposed API with access to data, exposed databases and so on. Um, but we're still seeing attacks, um, as you can see in the examples here, that are um, a result of an accidental public exposure. Um, and our research team found that from um, the minute that a, an S3 bucket is exposed to the internet, it only takes an attacker 13 hours to find that bucket. Um, and if the bucket name is mentioned in GitHub, um, it only takes them seven hours. So it's very critical to make sure that we are protected against these types of risks. Um, but as I mentioned, um, attacks in the cloud are really a combination of multiple risk factors. And um, it's not just exposure that we need to worry about. So um, an attack path in the cloud is what we call it with a toxic combination. So it's a combination of a risk that allows an attacker to gain an initial access to your cloud. So how can the attacker initially access the cloud? And then how can the attacker move laterally in, in the environment to reach your crown jewels? So when it comes to initial access to the cloud, um, there's risks like obviously vulnerable misconfigured applications, um, misconfigured cloud resources, end user compromise, supply chain, identity supply chain. Um, and we have to worry about all those things to make sure that we're protected and we're protecting our environment. But then um, we also want to make sure that if we are exposed, um, we, can't, we can't let an attacker move around laterally in our environment and reach our crown jewels. So, uh, we also need to worry about things like, um, do we have any insecure secrets in our environment, any internal network connectivity, identity connectivity, accessor permissions, or weak authentication that then would allow that lateral movement. So that's why um, it's important for security teams to be able to detect those attack paths. So again, a combination of initial access, lateral movement that then can lead to the crown jewels. Um, so as a security team, our goal would be to um, like Ron mentioned, be able to proactively remove those attack paths before they're exploited. Um, so we want to be able to detect them. We want to be able to prioritize, hey, this one is more critical than others. So I can tell my team, go focus on this first and don't waste your time on, let's say, a vulnerability on a machine that's not exposed. So we want to be able to proactively remove the most critical attack paths. But if um, in the case that we weren't able to remove every single attack path in the environment, we want to even after exposure, be able to detect any sort of threats and limit the blast radius. Um, so that's our overarching goal. So let's take a quick look at this graph. Um, so this speaks to the same point as Nick mentioned, where um, in the cloud, in the red, we can see um, as an organization adopts the cloud more, um, expands the cloud footprint, adds more and more technologies, um, and innovates in the cloud. So there's their need in cloud security grow exponentially, as we can see here. Um, however, we know that security teams can't grow as fast as our cloud environment grows, sadly. Um, and oftentimes the security team that really has to focus on really keeping the lights on and addressing many, many alerts like we discussed. And what this results in is the gaps on the right side here. So this can lead to them focusing on risks that are not critical, and due to that missing on those critical risks, it can result in blind spot um, and even a distrust between the security team and the developers. Um, for example, if the security team sends all these alerts to the developers telling them remediate this, but then they go in um, and they find out the machine is not exposed and so on. Um, that really like leads to distrust between the two teams. So with that, uh, we, we think that we can't keep on doing the same thing. And because of it, we think it's time for a new cloud security operating model. So what does this operating model look like for us? So we look at cloud security as a unified platform, as we mentioned, the CNAP platform that takes in all these siloed tools and brings them together to a single platform. So um, traditionally organizations, um, let's say had a vulnerability, vulnerability management tool they received alerts for vulnerabilities in their environment, but they lack the greater context around the machine that's vulnerable. What are their, what are its permissions? Um, is it misconfigured? Um, and so on. So that really led to organizations spending a lot of time on triaging alerts to understand which ones they need to focus on. So what Wiz does is that we bring in all these different capabilities together. So um, CSPM looking at misconfigurations, vulnerability ma management, CWPP, 
um, Kim. So looking at identities, um, data security, IC scanning, and all of these are built on the same platform um, to allow us to use the same context across all the different risk factors, bring it together um, to help our customers prioritize attack paths. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but a big part of it also of this operating model is that we want to scale our security team. And in order to do that, we need to provide them with a tool that is very easy to use so they can share the security responsibility across the organization. So with Wiz, um, more than 50% of our users are actually developers because we make it very easy for them to log in and see, hey, these are my most critical risks that I need to focus on. Um, and then they don't need to be a security expert in order to use the tool. So it's essentially a unified platform that caters to all teams within the organization. Um, so we also look at security um, as a holistic view across the, the cloud lifecycle. So we start off with um, the security posture in the cloud. So providing customers with agentless visibility into their cloud environment and risk prioritization so they can reduce the attack surface. But then we also allow customers to shift left, which we'll see what that looks like, um, and secure everything in their software development lifecycle. So they get both to protect their cloud and then shift that left to their development lifecycle um, using all the same policies. Um, and then last but not least, to shift right to um, the runtime with a lightweight um, agent that allows customers to detect any threats in the environment, um, whether if in case they weren't proactively removed and then reduce the blast radius. So um, to quickly demonstrate what that looks like, so uh, Wiz is built on top of a security graph. So we call it the Wiz security graph that essentially um, so we first scan your cloud environment, whether, whatever cloud you run on, um, and we do this um, scan without any agents. So it uses the cloud providers APIs. And then we scan everything that's in your environment, whether it's serverless containers, virtual machines, and any technology that's running on top of those. And then we take that and we map it all in the WIS security graph, uh, which makes it very easy to understand the relationship between the different resources. So that's th step number one, so agentless scanning. Then we run the deep risk assessment. So um, we, as I mentioned, as part of CNAP, we look at a lot of different types of risks. So we look at uh, example vulnerabilities, exposed secrets, malware, um, permissions, are there any excessive um, permissions, sensitive data, misconfigurations, public exposures. And then, so we run this risk assessment and we map all the risks we find on the same security graph. And what is the benefit of doing that? When we map all the risks on the same graph, it allows Wiz to really understand those critical attack paths that I mentioned. So um, here for an example, we have a virtual machine. We can see that it has a critical vulnerability on it. But now because we have the greater context here, Wiz is able to say that, hey, I found this virtual machine to be publicly exposed. Um, so we run our network analysis and we found a path to the internet from the virtual machine. So we know it is vulnerable. Now we know it's publicly exposed. But hey, we also found that the role that is attached to the machine allows it access to a data store that's used for AI training that has sensitive PII data in it. So essentially here, Wiz tells you, hey, I found an attack path where an, where an attacker can reach your sensitive PII data. And this is a type of critical risk that you need to prioritize. So this is what the graph allows us to do. It allows us to provide our customers with that exact risk prioritization. So the next step of this operating model, once we're able to prioritize the risks, is make sure that um, that customers are able to understand ownership of those risks or across different teams. So we have this concept of WIS projects that you can assign different teams in the organization, for example, your developers, with a specific project of all the resources that they own so they can view the, um, the risks related to their resources. And this allows them to log into WIS and only see the risks related to what they own so they don't get overwhelmed with the greater security data across the organization. So the next step after you determine the ownership of who owns that risk is to make sure that you have um, workflows in place to help speed up remediation. So with Wiz, we integrate with many, many third-party providers to help you uh, 
uh, either whether it's send tickets to the right team via um, Jira or send a message from Slack or just integrate with many other tools to send the data to or um, do automatic remediation within the cloud. But you can set up those workflows to make sure that critical risks get remediated fast. So as I mentioned, um, the next part, so that was the, um, the security posture in the cloud, but now we learn from the cloud and we want to be able to shift left to detect those risks early on before they even reach into our cloud environment. So we have a set of different capabilities that allow you to shift left, whether it's our ISC scanning or um, code scanning that allows you to detect um, that exposed secrets or sensitive data and code so your developers can quickly fix it. Um, and that really allows you to create those golden images and make sure you're protected um, from the code before even any of those risks reach the cloud. And that all uses the same policy across the cloud and in your um, code pipeline. So last but not least, um, it's possible that we weren't able to remove every critical attack path in the environment. And because of that, we want to make sure that we're still protected um, in case any threats do come up. So to do that, we also provide customers with the capability to take advantage of our runtime sensor, which is a lightweight um, agent that allows it to detect runtime threats. So um, things like a reverse shell or crypto miner. And um, we notify them when we find those run runtime threats. And we also correlate those threats back, back to all the other contexts we have. So the cloud context, as well as cloud events in order to allow customers to understand, hey, I found this threat in my container, but then I'm also able to tell that the attacker escaped the container. And now I know they can assume this role and reach my sensitive data. So we provide all that context in one place in order to help customers remove the blast radius of any threat that they find. Okay, so before I wrap it up, I just wanted to call out um, uh, on the theme of AI, our recent AI SPM capabilities. So we added support for AI security capabilities that allow customers to secure any AI they build in the cloud. So we provide customers with visibility into their AI pipeline. We extend the same risk assessment to the AI pipeline um, in order to help customers remove those AI risks um, in their models. And um, these are some of the, the main services that we support. So Amazon Bedrock, SageMaker, OpenAI, Google Vertex AI, Azure OpenAI, and so on, um, as well as we provide visibility to any hosted AI that you have in your environment. Um, and this is just an example of an AI security risk that we would map on the graph that can show you how, can, how someone can gain access to your AI training data um, in, a, in your storage buckets. So this really allows you to make sure that your um, training data is protected and remove any of those risks um, early on also in your AI pipelines. And with that, I will wrap it up because I think I'm at time. Um, but uh, please, if you're interested in being getting in touch with us, um, we have our, um, this is our website and you can contact us for a demo um, as well as follow us on LinkedIn. And I think that's it. Back to you, Ron.